You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast produced by Veteran Strategies and featuring conversations with fascinating and impactful men and women who have shaped our world, our communities, and our history. My name is Robert Vane, Principal of Veteran Strategies, and your host for our discussion. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel, Grand Hall, and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. We are pleased to announce our podcast is now a member of the All Indiana Podcast Network in partnership with Wish TV. You can find Leaders and Legends at allindianapodcastnetwork.com. Thank you for joining us on the podcast. Our guest today is Marianne Glick. She has made her mark along with her family and not only the fabric of the city, but the infrastructure of the city. And as someone who grew up on the east side in Irvington, she has a particular, uh, I am very grateful for what she's done for the far east side. Our co-host today is President. You have all kinds of titles, don't you? How many do you have? Just CEO. Just CEO. Our Pontifex Maximus, Queen, Empress, Danielle Shockey, Girl Scouts of Central Indiana. She always does a terrific job when she's on with us. You're a wonderful person, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, sir. Glad to be here. Marianne, thank you so much for agreeing to come and, and tell a little bit of your story um, to our listeners today. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. No, again, like I'm, I'm in wonderful company with, with both of you and all of the Im impressive leaders that have been on here before. Well, and don't sell yourself short. I think when Robert talks about the fabric of the city, they're so... So much legacy, um, both that your family your, your, um, has, has left and that you continue to, uh, I guess, weave, if you will, to use that fabric and tapestry analogy. Um, but for our listeners who maybe really are not familiar with um, the Glick Company, the Glick Family Foundation, tell us just that little bit of backstory um, or as much of the backstory as you'd like to give context to our listeners. Sure. Um, I'll start with the Glick Company. Uh, my mom and dad started the Glick Company in 1947, uh, about the time that they got married and uh, began building single family homes uh, as the GIs were coming back from World War II and starting families. Uh, they built homes uh, through the 1970s. And at that time, they also started then building multifamily housing. And we have uh, about 20,000 apartments in 13 states now. Uh, we also have a housing foundation, which provides affordable housing. And we have 6,000 units in our housing foundation and have started a program recently where we are uh, helping agencies to house homeless people because that's uh, uh, often it's difficult to find and especially during COVID to find safe housing for, uh, for people who are homeless. Um, and then the foundation was started in the mid 1980s um, as my parents began to um, reap the benefits of their labors. Uh, they started the, the housing foundation, uh, the Fa Glick Foundation. And uh, we focus on four areas, arts and creative expression, helping those in need, self-sufficiency and education. Very good. And so you mentioned when your, when your father started the, the company, um, tell us a little bit about, kind of, I guess, I mean, I've read and I've heard the story, but what was his vision? I mean, he, he was coming out of a um, military, young, working in banking, if I recall, how yes. did he, how did this, 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 this come to be for your family? My dad worked in uh, the mortgage loan department of People's Bank, which is no longer in existence. Uh, and, and because he was a GI and he saw these GIs coming home uh, and wanting to get homes, but having difficulty getting loans, 
he began, uh, he convinced the bank to start a GI loan program, uh, which had much more flexible uh, parameters for giving loans to people. Um, and then as he saw these GIs getting homes and how important that was to them, uh, he realized that what he really wanted to do was to be building homes and providing uh, a place to live for, for these people. And so they begin building one home at a time. And my mother, they, they worked an arrangement where uh, if a person already had a home, they would buy that home uh, and, and guarantee the sale of that if the person would buy one of their new homes. So my mom was very actively involved uh, at that time. And she really went and got all of the materials because dad was, as they were starting this, dad was still working at the bank. And so my mother, who was like five feet tall and weighed a hundred pounds, <laughs> is hauling this construction equipment all over town. And I know one time she got a flat tire and, and I think she had to call dad, he came from the office. Um, they really enjoyed that early part where they were building the business together. That's such a, I don't know, just such an inspirational story. And I think, and I, what I want you to talk about Marianne is how that really had set the foundation for, for really what all of Glick stands for today. I mean, you're kind of where your dad started in helping people yeah. still exists in almost, like, like you said, everything that you're doing. I want you to talk about teen works and how that got its start. Um, it's just, they've never, you're, you're, the entire organization seems to have never strayed from that beginning thinking of, we can help others. And I just think that's such a powerful part of the story. Yes, I, I agree. Uh, I think that my folks always felt that um, everybody deserves uh a nice place to live and uh, the opportunity to achieve their dreams and be the best that they can be. And, and I think my folks always exemplified that. Uh, and I certainly try to carry on that legacy as well to, to, to have opportunities regardless of your, uh, what zip code you were born into. Um, uh, and, and even your level of education. So, so, providing opportunities for everyone. Did you um, ever, re did you ever find yourself, um, I, got, I don't know, growing pains, rebelling against, or was this just <laughs> some, well, well, I mean, you know, you, you look at your parents and you think, well, that's my parents, they're not. I, I, it, so was there ever a moment where you weren't on board with all of this work or has it always just kind of been part of the, I guess the motto of your family? Well, in my teens and twenties, I would say that I wasn't exactly on on board. I was the, I would say I was the rebel of the family. Uh, my mother wrote a book, um, and in the book, uh, I am in the chapter entitled "Trials and Tribulations," and my sisters are in the chapter "And the Girls Grow Up." So, <laughs> there there was a distinct difference between me and my sisters, and and um, I, I think that. Um, I always had a different idea of how I should be brought up than uh, my parents did. And of course they were the grownups, so um, I rebelled. <laughs> That's great, thanks for sharing that. So I, I wanna pivot a little bit to talk about, um, I know there's many projects that right now um, you continue to foster and you're passionate about. And one of those is TeenWorks but um, that's actually not, hasn't always been its name. And so tell us the story of really how I think your father started Teamworks. Yes. And then how, you, how you've pivoted it and how you see it in the future. Thank you. When my parents first established the foundation, the first thing, the initiative that they did was called Pro 100. Uh, my dad loved golf, both my parents played golf. And so TeenWorks was a youth employment program that employed at-risk youth uh, during the summer. And they started out working on city golf courses, doing beautification projects on these golf courses. And there were a hundred children in the program. So they worked with the golf professionals um, at, these, at the golf courses. So it was pro, for the golf professionals, 100, because there were 100 kids. Um, and the, the program really was very successful uh, 
dad wanted to um, teach them life skills and job skills that would serve them well in, in their futures. So we, not only did they learn a work ethic, uh, but they also worked, generally the supervisors were high school teachers who knew how to work with kids. And uh, we, they learned things like conflict re resolution, resume writing, um, how to do an interview. These are things that are still in the program today. Um, and I remember dad told me, and I have observed this myself, that when the kids first start in the program, you know, you go and say to meet them and they're kind of looking down and seem very shy, hesitant to talk, might not even know how to shake your hand in a business type way. Um, and, and by the end of the summer, he said he, he loved going out to see their final projects because they'd walk up to him and shake the, his hand and introduce themselves. And the, the confidence they gained through this experience was just immeasurable. Um, and I, I see this with our, with our kids today. Um, when my dad became ill and I got more involved in the program, um, because we did not have, at that time, we only had 80 children in the program um, and we were no longer working on city golf courses, we did a survey and realized that the Pro 100 name, nobody could explain it. It didn't carry the meaning of what we were doing. So we did a rebranding and became a 501c3. Um, a charitable organization. And so we renamed it Teen Works because it's teens working. So <laughs> the name explains what we do now. Um, and we have grown the program. This summer we had 225 uh, students from Indianapolis and from Muncie. We've got a program in Muncie. Um, and not only do we have a summer program, we have a year round program for the juniors and seniors where they uh, meet for professional development sessions on a monthly basis, and they have program managers that assist them in doing um, an individual uh, development plan so that, that they can plan out what they see for their future uh, beyond high school, but to help them think about, well, while I'm in high school, what things do I want to be doing to better prepare myself for that future that I want? And that we also provide scholarships for college um, or post-secondary, so credentialing as well, but help them plan that, that future. And we have an alumni services program to help them when they're in college. Is there a particular Teen Works um, story that you think is one that you share because it really kind of epitomizes the success of what Teen Works um, is and does? Um, I'm thinking of a young lady uh, right now, her name is Diocelene, and uh, she, her, her family uh, immigrated to this country from El Salvador. And she started with Teen Works when she was, uh, had just finished her freshman year of high school. She graduated um, last June from IUPUI, she had received one of our scholarships um, and she uh, is now working, doing contract tracing for the uh, Indiana State Department of Health. Um, and I hate to tell them this, but we are actually trying to hire her to um, help us with our alumni services group because she's multilingual. And we, we think that she would be fabulous and her, she really wants to help other people. She said she saw how much Teen Works helped her and she wants to be able to provide that for other um, students like herself. That's tremendous. Well, hopefully this podcast will not be public by the time you make this decision and they, they will never known. Kind of steal <laughs> I, I'm pretty, I, I believe that our CEO has already talked to her about this, so it won't be a surprise to her. <laughs> Got it, okay. I'm gonna give Robert a chance to have some oxygen here. Just a few minutes because I, I want Danielle to lead this. But one of the people we've interviewed is who actually then came on again in a, in a separate podcast. But one of the people we talked to is Brian Payne. Oh, yes. Please tell us about his connection to your family and, 
and the impact he's made uh, through the CICF on Indianapolis, on, on central Indiana. Brian is an amazing leader. Um, I've, I've been on the CICF board for most of the time during the last 11 years, uh, so have gotten to know him pretty well. But uh, prior to my getting on that board, um, uh, Brian had a vision for the city and met with my parents to talk to them about the cultural trail uh, when it was just an idea and really encouraged them to, to make a lead gift for this vision. Um, my parents were uh, avid exercisers, um, uh, thought it was very important for people to be active um, and also uh, were very interested in the arts and the cultural trail connects many of the arts communities uh, in Indianapolis. So um, after many conversations, uh, convinced my parents to, to make that lead gift. Um, looking, looking back now, um, I'm, my mother was um, able to attend the opening of the cultural trail and I know how meaningful that was to her. Um, my dad was not able to, and I, I know that that was so important to him and how proud they would be now to see the tremendous development that has occurred as a result of this cultural trail. If you look at Massachusetts Avenue, for example, or Fountain Square and what those areas looked like 10 years ago and what they look like today, um, I believe over $1 billion of uh, economic growth has occurred because of the cultural trail. So um, our family couldn't be more proud of, of the gifts that my parents have given. This is the one that I think has had the greatest impact on the city and that I'm most proud of. Were you involved in the discussion or the genesis of the Peace Walk? Yes. That's a part of the cultural trail. It, it's away from Mass Ave, away from Fountain Square, but it's, it's kind of between Mass Ave and the canal. Please talk about how important that is to you, uh, to your family, and how were the people who are honored there, how were they selected? Yes, I was involved in those early conversations. Uh, my dad felt that there were plenty of monuments to war and he wanted uh, and had been looking for probably 20 years before this happened uh, to try to find some monument to peace. And so um, we had originally talked about perhaps having um, these statues around the city, but decided that, that an entrance into the downtown area um, would be, and having them in one location, most of them in one location, would be more meaningful. So um, we spent several months uh, researching individuals that would be possibilities and had um, a committee of, uh, of the foundation board who looked at the names, looked at the people, looked at their history uh, to come up with the people that we felt would be um, a good representation of people who had had, had a major impact on um, peace in this country and bringing the country together. Um, and it's, it's really lovely to go over there, the fact that the Cultural Trail Office is now um, on the Peace Walk and that um, uh, the Phoenix Theater is actually at the entrance of the Peace Walk as well. Um, uh, I just think it, looking at the, these beautiful glass and steel sculptures and then the, um, beautiful stonework that is on the ground that makes up the Peace Walk and sort of tells the highlights of the story of these individuals um, is just inspirational. Please tell the Leaders and Legends audience, uh, Leaders and Legends audience, some of the names who are on the Peace Walk, just in case they've never gone past that part sure. of downtown. 
um, Andrew Carnegie, Jonas Salk, uh, Mark Twain, Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt, um, Abraham Lincoln, Helen Keller. Those are the ones that come to mind. I know that there's there's 10 of them and I'm not coming up with all 10. You mentioned the Cultural Trail Office. Uh, I was working for Mayor Ballard when the section of the Cultural Trail was uh, dedicated that's right by the canal. Uh-huh. And, and Car Karen Haley, uh, who we worked together again uh, for Mayor Ballard and then Brian Sullivan, uh, who was the chairman or I believe was heavily involved. Yeah. Our families grew up together in Irvington and Brian's and his wife, Marianne, are two of the most uh, dedicated civic leaders the city's had in a long, long time. Yes. How important is it to you, to the family, not only to have people like Brian involved on like a volunteer basis, but also to recruit talent like I know Karen Haley is? Well, it's essential. Uh, the The cultural trail is uh, 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 really a living, breathing, growing um, asset for our community. And having leaders in the community who take a personal interest in the board and ensuring that it is all that it can be makes an enormous difference. One of the benefits of being involved in the city is you you can look at initiatives, or in some cases buildings, and say, when I was in the mayor's office, I had a hand in this. Yeah. Uh, I remember Joe Loftus, who used to work for, uh, who I'm sure you know, used to work for Steve Goldsmith, would talk about being involved uh, with the mall. It's fun to listen to Jim Morris talk about Market Square Arena, Arena and the decision to build that downtown in the mid seventies. For me personally, uh, the Irvington Charter School was an idea that I brought to Mayor Ballard and in typical Mayor Ballard fashion, he didn't even look up from what he was reading. He just said, well, yeah, go do it. For your family, for you to, to walk around and we're gonna turn it back over to Danielle in a second, but to, to just walk out of Whole Foods or walk out of the city market or ride your bike and see your parents' name. How does that, how does that hit you? Well, I can tell you that um, I'm choking up now. Many times it brings tears to my eyes. Um, uh, to, to think that um, I'm related to these people that have had uh, such a huge impact on the city. Um, I'm, I'm humbled and I'm so proud um, that uh, that they've set this kind of an example and provided, helped to provide this um, terrific asset for the city. But I, 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 there's rarely a time that I walk on the trail um, or ride on the trail and I am not touched uh, by that. You're listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel, Grand Hall, and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bowes, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bowes Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Our guest on the Leaders and Legends podcast is Marianne Glick, and our co-host is CEO, Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Danielle Shockey. It's all yours. So I have to I have to tell a story real quickly, if that's okay, because we talked yeah. about the, the cultural tra trail quite a bit. And Girl Scouts hosts every year um, Lieutenant Governor's Leadership Luncheon. And Marianne served as the, um, I think that year you were the actual luncheon chair. Is that yeah. correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. And so part of, we always do video introductions. And so my team, well, like their favorite luncheon was yours. And this is pre me, so I take no credit, but they said you actually did all the different taping along the cultural trail. And then the day of the luncheon, she rode down the aisle on a pacer bike um, into the event. So, yes, I did. Yes, yeah, so you have quite the, uh, the person who told me said you just have such a creative spirit. And 
And for those listeners who may not know, um, we've spent a lot of time talking about initiatives and legacy and and so forth. And we will come back to that. But you're also an artist. And so um, talk about, I mean, Girl Scouts headquarters actually is a very proud, um, I guess, recipient of two Glick art installments, um, amazing murals done with girls that today, and Marianne, I don't know if you know this, but little girls will still come and they remember which piece of the glass was theirs Aww. because they were brought in to make this amazing butterfly um, mosaic is the, the most untrained word I can use. Yeah. Um, so, but tell, tell our listeners about that, your passion for art. When did it start? Do you remember realizing this is something that I'm, I love and I'm good at? How, what, what does that play in your life? So it was not something I was good at. It was really not something I'd ever done. Um, I, uh, I really love art. And when uh, Mike and I got married and uh, bought this house and we, I was realizing after a few years that um, we ought to have something besides posters um, in our house. We were over 50 and it was time to, <laughs> to buy some art. So I was going on eBay purchasing art and, and Mike's daughters, his three daughters had all were in new homes at that time. Uh, so I was buying art for us and for them. So really almost on a daily basis, we were getting shipments from eBay and I was waking up or staying up until two and three o'clock in the morning to be able to get that last bit in at the last second. And, and at one point late that summer, Mike goes, you know, there's a, there, you're getting kind of obsessed with this. So, so um, do you think maybe you could do some of these paintings? Do you think you could try your hand at this? And I thought, oh, I had never thought of that before. And my, I was slowing up in my um, training business at that point. I thought, you know, I think I have time. So I started taking art classes, but I had never done art before. Um, so I didn't know anything about it and had to learn from, you know, what brushes you needed and how to apply the paint and just, from at the, like at the very, very beginning. Um, and so I'm, I loved it once I started trying it and um, am, am very pleased to say that I'm able to sell my art and uh, uh, people seem to enjoy it. So I'm happy if they're happy. And it's also a part, it's another part of kind of the giving back. Oftentimes, um, again, I think you're donating your art. I do, and, I do yeah. donate uh, quite a bit of art and then, um, uh, most of the time now, if I have an exhibit, um, I will ask a charity to have someone come and, and uh, accept the money from the sales. And so that the money, uh, 25 to 50% of the sale price will go to that organization. And, and it truly is beautiful. So I Thank mean, I, if, if our listeners have not seen or tried to see some of your art, I would encourage them to do so. So we were right before this little down memory lane about the bicycle and Girl Scouts, we were talking about Indianapolis. And, you know, like, as you said, it, it makes you proud and, and, you know, a little choked up to think about seeing your name and your family's name. But with that, do you also have some visions, some dreams of yet what you would like to see? Um, in Indianapolis, in central Indiana, and maybe not through the Glick um, Foundation or others, but what, what, what do you think we need right now most in our community? So I, I think COVID has brought a lot of things to light that maybe we weren't quite as focused on. Uh, one is certainly racial equity. And um, uh, a lot of what our foundation focuses on what Mike and I focus on is is making sure that um, uh, students, regardless of the color of their skin, um, have opportunities. Um, so I'm probably most involved with TeenWorks and also with Ivy Tech. So so both of these organizations um, are really helping people in Indiana students in Indiana to get the education they need so that they can have a better job, a good job, a good career um, and, and make a living wage. Um, and, and hopefully 
uh, some of them will become entrepreneurs and start new businesses and um, grow their own wealth and our economy. Uh, but uh, I've been doing a tremendous amount of, of reading lately, trying to educate myself on um, uh, the challenges that um, uh, people of color face in our country and, and to think more constructively about um, what I can do, what we can do um, to make things better. Uh, and, and we need to, there's a long way we need to go. Uh, education is another area. So the, the, the education gap between students of color and white students, um, regardless of the township and really regardless of the state, this is a problem all over the country um, that we really have to uh, find solutions for. We're leaving kids behind and that's, and you know, obviously with COVID where they can't even go to school um, and, and many kids don't have access to good internet connections, uh, if they have a computer, they're falling further and further behind. And this is something we really have to address. Do you think the right people are coming together right now and having those conversations? I think the education one is just, I was talking to somebody the other day. I mean, if you think about Jonathan Kozal and Savage Inequalities, and that was in the 70s, and that was Gary, Indiana, and we still haven't made it very far. And we so have not. No, it's... Um, uh, uh, change uh, change in general and certainly systems change happens so slowly um, but we 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 can't keep doing what we've been doing and and think that we're going to have better results just paying teachers more money is is not the answer I think we do need to pay our teachers more money but um, there are so many more supports that are needed in the schools uh, teachers don't have all of the skills that are going to solve all of the challenges that face education. But um, I think having high expectations and providing excellent education and giving uh, teachers and schools some flexibility um, so that they can try new things. Uh, I've, I've been looking all over the country to find, uh, you know, are there places that are doing this really well? And certainly we have some in India, Paramount School. Is, is an example of, of a charter school in Indianapolis that's working with um, lower in income children and are having fabulous results um, with them. So it, these things are possible. We just have to figure out what, what those um, steps are and, and institute it in more of our schools. Yeah, I, I think you know my background is education for you know 20 years before Girl Scouts. And I think I have to think there's a nugget of something in the collective. If you take Teamworks and you take Girl Scouts and you take other organizations who all have, I think, a piece of the potential solution. Yeah. But how do we bring us all together so collectively we can identify gaps and identify places where we can work together um, to reach more students? So you keep working on it. We'll keep working on it. I know, yeah. Everybody needs to be working on it. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned Ivy Tech briefly in your last answer. And so I know there's some new work going on between you and Ivy Tech right now. Tell our listeners a little bit about that um, and where you where you see the connection for Ivy Tech. It's an amazing system. It and is. I, think it, I think it's a system that unfortunately has, still has a little bit of a, um, a reputation hill to climb, right? People don't see it as an opportunity for every student. We're lucky Indiana has it. So just talk a little bit about what you see with the Ivy Tech partnership um, in your work. So the average age for students at Ivy Tech is 27 years old. So many of the students have gone out into the workplace and um, are realizing that they need additional education um, in order to have the kinds of jobs that, that they are desiring. And so Ivy Tech can be that opportunity. Um, Ivy Tech works really closely with businesses in each of the cities where it has locations and they are in uh, 19 different cities in Indiana. Uh, there are over 100,000 students attending Ivy Tech throughout the state. So for our state to really upskill um, our workforce, 
I think Ivy Tech is a tremendous answer for that. Um, also, not every student um, needs a four-year college education uh, to have the kind of job opportunities that they're looking for. And uh, so credentials and certifications can be really helpful as well as the associate degrees to give people really good paying jobs. Absolutely, yes, and, and I have to give a shout out because Sue Elsperman, the president of Ivy Tech is on the Girl Scouts board. And um, I think she's absolutely brilliant. She is. I and, and a Leaders and Legends podcast guest. Yes. Absolutely. But we only have brilliant guests. <laughs> Well, well I, I've been so impressed with Sue. I I will tell you that um, I fought really hard to get on the Ivy Tech board. I don't usually seek out boards to be on. And um, I uh, having a Republican governor appoint me when I am not a Republican, I thought was pretty impressive. But literally, I had every Republican person I knew calling the governor, asking him <laughs> to appoint me. <laughs> I just think that, that Ivy Tech is so important for our state. Um, and uh, I am thrilled to be able to, to be on their board and see the good work that they are doing. Well, right there gave me something to aspire to. I want your next board request to be mine. How's that? <laughs> so. well, I, I'm I'm a I'm a but I don't know if I'm gonna come on your board, but thank you. <laughs> I'll recommend, I'm a Republican, I'll recommend her. That seems to be what works. <laughs> so um, so we, I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, the Far East Side. And um, I know this is a place that, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I know I personally know, um, having lived and worked on that side of town and was a principal in that part of the city, really the inequities are very, 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 um, I don't know, grave there. So how, tell me about the work you're doing on the Far East Side. I know, I know the history, but tell our listeners the history of why the Far East Side, what's your personal connection there and, and what's your vision, what's your hope for that? So the reason that um, we, the Glick Foundation uh, focuses on the Far East Side, um, when I grew up and I lived uh, at 38th and Wallace, which is essentially 38th and Arlington. And um, my dad built most of his homes on the far east side. And then one of our very first affordable apartment developments and one of the largest that we have in the country is at 42nd and Midhoffer. Um, and my father's office for 25 years was near 42nd and Midhoffer. So we have a long history on that side of town. And of course, when I was uh, growing up, when I was a little girl, that area of town was bustling. Uh, all kinds of plants over there, uh, major employers. Um, and as those factories shut down, uh, the, that side of town had a lot of economic challenges. So, we felt by um, sort of lending our support and our interest to that area of town um, and, and gathering folks that live in that area. So we've got, we've got a committee that um, we were instrumental in helping to form. Uh, Lakeisha Jackson, who's the city councilor from that area has also been incredibly helpful. The uh, pastors from some of the churches in that area have been very helpful. So it's, it's a, there's a coalition now on that side of town that helps advise us and others on, on what they see the needs are. And, and what we really try to do is help support what the community is hoping to achieve. Um, uh, we were able to get the very first innovation school in Indianapolis in that neighborhood. Um, and there's now, uh, Phelan has also got a middle school and a high school. So there are, there are good schools available in the neighborhood now. Uh, Finish Line 
has built a boys and girls club in the neighborhood. The uh, cafe, the Community Alliance for the Far East Side um, has uh, uh, an excellent executive director now and they are they have a center for working families that has been the most successful other than the Bonner Center I think in the city uh, so we're um, uh, providing work opportunities we also built at Carriage House East Carriage House East is now in our housing foundation we have three service coordinators that help residents get the services that they need um, and we also have a center for working families at our our community at that success center. Um, so we're just um, wanting to provide every opportunity that we can that is important to the neighborhood. So I try to stay in the background and, and let the residents uh, inform what should take place there. I, I don't think it's right for us to come and go, well, here's what we think you know, should happen. Um, so I think we've been pretty successful in that and we're, we're working with that group to, um, to talk about, there was an apartment complex that's been torn down, what to do with that space, what to do with John Marshall. And so we're still in discussions with how might we envision these spaces that are no longer in use to make them um, useful and productive for the community again that the model you just, just described in terms of engaging the residents to really determine what it is they think they need. Um, there has to be a lot of lessons learned so far. So I, I hope that upon continued success in that area, hopefully that can be lessons learned to other communities, other states, other places that have similar challenges. We are hopeful that that will be the case. Is there a particular Hoosier leader or legend you admire? Other than, well, in addition to my parents, um, I, so I think Jim Morris has been um, a tremendous influence on our city. Um, he is one of the nicest and really most humble people that I've ever met. He, he will write personal handwritten notes. Um, uh, I've gotten a few from him and I'm always just shocked that he would take the time um, to do this. Uh, he, he really cares about the city and he really cares about people. Um, I, I've just been very, very impressed with him. We end every podcast with the same five questions. So you're going to be in the company of Jim Morris and Brian Payne, and it's an attempt to kind of jog the memory and, and maybe uh, get you to uh, expand on a preference or two. And usually I do it, but whenever uh, Danielle's the co-host, we want her to do it. So without uh, any delay, Danielle, you're up. Okay, but I need six. Because there is one question I had to ask. And I, so I don't know if you know this, Robert, but Marianne was kicked out of the Girl Scouts. For during her rebellious know. period? I don't know. So I think was, yes, it was during my rebellious period. So this was in um, seventh grade. And I had written a note, and this is an appropriate time of the year. It was a, a uh, I'd written a poem to Twas the Night Before Christmas, but um, I'd actually used every dirty word I'd ever heard in the note. And I had passed it to a friend of mine who got caught with it in Mr. Benbow's uh, social studies class. It, you, know, you know, it really was important to me if I remember the teacher's name 50, <laughs> 60 years later um, and went to the principal. So I got expelled from school. Um, Which school? West Lane Junior High. Hmm. And... Uh, uh, it was on, oh, and I was expelled on my mother's birthday. And she thought that I had done this purposely to punish her, <laughs> which wasn't the case. And then my dad wanted me to explain what every one of those words meant. And quite honestly, I didn't know what a lot of those words meant. <laughs> so um, when the Girl Scouts found out about that, um, uh, that I had gotten expelled, they let me know that I was no longer part of the Girl Scouts. 
Wow. Did you get back in? Uh, Becky Skillman, the year that I got an award from the Girl Scouts, uh, which was the year before I chaired, uh, she reinstated me. So I thought that was very nice. <laughs> She's on the wall. She's in good standing. <laughs> She's, good. She's good. All good. All right. Well, thanks for sharing. That's, uh, I, I'm going to say that's why your mother chose that title for the chapter. Yes, it is. That, well, it's one of the reasons. <laughs> It's becoming clear. So, okay. So the five questions that we ask all of our guests, what was your first job? Uh, my first job was um, working in the locker room at a, 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 the swimming pool at one of my dad's housing developments. Uh, there was a swimming pool and I was too young to be a lifeguard. So I would you know, when people would have clothes and they would want to put them in the lockers and stuff while they were swimming, um, I was in charge of that. That was my, that was my first job. Okay. How about your first concert? Oh gosh, first concert. Um, well, the Beatles, I think was my first concert when they came, 1964, when they came to Indianapolis at the state fairgrounds. And right, we'll look to Robert, no follow-up questions there. This is like his, this is like his thing. Music. Well, one of the things that's interesting that we find out when we do the five questions, and I believe it was in the conversation we had with Mark Miles, is he grew up by the fairgrounds and the Beatles rode in a car right past his front porch and he just sat there and watched the Beatles drive by. Wow. Okay. So could, if, if you could suggest a book for someone to read, which book would you recommend? I'd recommend the book Cast uh, by Isabel Wilkerson. I, I finished that a couple of weeks ago and I would say that if you want to understand um, the challenges with race in our country, that um, this would be one of the best books you could possibly read. I, I learned so much from reading that book. Excellent. And if you could witness an event in history, be there as it happened, what mm. event would you choose? Uh, I think I would like to have seen the first space shot live. When, when in 1969, when men landed on the moon, I would like to have been there when that was shut off. And then the last five of the fifth, if you could have dinner with anybody living today, two hours off the record to just chat, who would you choose? Um, Barack Obama. Uh, I, uh, am, I just started reading his book, Promised Land. Uh, I, think so highly of him and have had the opportunity of recently to hear him a few times on some of the talk shows and uh, just his calm uh, demeanor, uh, his bearing, and he's so smart. Um, I, I would love to be able to sit down with him. I was able to see Michelle when she was here a couple of years ago um, and, and she's a wonderful speaker, but sort of having an inside scoop with him would be uh, a thrill. Very good, thank you. You have been listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel, Grand Hall, and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Our guest today has been Marianne Glick. She is a painter. She is a philanthropist. She is a, a rebel. <laughs> and we are very grateful for your time. It was a wonderful discussion. And Danielle, as always, I love co-hosting with you. It's great to see you. You too. Thanks a lot, you guys. This was great. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. 
That's Robert at VeteranStrategies.com. Strategies.com.